Section 1 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. Sim Vetter's Kite by W.O. Stoddard. The kite fever visited Hagerstown every year and caught all the boys over five before it subsided. It generally crept in slowly, a boy and a kite at a time. But this year it came as if a big wind brought it. Yesterday there had been three kites up at one time in the main street, and Squire Jones' pony had been scared into a canter. The squire and Mrs. Jones and the three Mrs. Jones and Aunt Hepzibah had been in the carry all at the time, and they all screamed when the pony began to canter. So the squire had told the boys he could not have any more of that dangerous nonsense in the streets, and they had all come out to Dr. Gay's pasture on the side hill today, and they had eight kites among them. Some vetter is coming, boys, said Parley Hooker. He's been making a kite. He? exclaimed Joe Myers. He's a grown-up man. What does he know about kites? There he comes now anyway. They all turned toward the bars and looked, for not one of them had sent up his kite yet. Oh, what a kite! It's as tall as he is. No, it isn't. He's carrying it on his shoulder. It's just an awful kite. Simvetter was the man who worked for Dr. Gay, and he was as thin as a fence rail. So was his face, and his hook nose had a queer twist in it halfway to the point. He was coming with what looked like an enormous kite, trying all the way while to get away from him. All the boys wanted to ask questions, but they didn't know exactly what to ask, so they kept still. Kiting, are you? Well, just you let me look at your kites, and then you may look at mine. One at a time now. Keep back. Make that kite yourself, Parley. Yes, I made it. Had plenty of wood around your house, I guess. Your sticks are bigger than mine, and your kite is only two feet high, and mine's five. Look at it. He turned the back of his kite toward them as he spoke, and they saw that the framework of it was made of a number of very slender slips of what looked like ash or hickory wood. Mine's made of pine, said Parley, and yours will break, too. No, it won't. Well, maybe yours will fly. Set it a-going. There's a plenty of wind. Parley obeyed, and mainly because there was indeed a good deal of wind, his heavy-made kite began to go up. Joe, said some vetter, hand me that kite of yours. Mine's a diamond. I don't know how to make any other. Do you suppose it will stand steady with those four bands so close together? No, it won't. Up with it and see how it will wiggle. Bob Jones, is that yours? The third kite was meekly handed to him, for the more boys stared at Sim's big kite, the more they believed he knew what he was talking about. It isn't a bad kite, but those four bands are crossed too low. It'll dive all over. There's plenty of tail, Sim. It can't dive. Tail? And a bunch of mayweed at the end of it. How's a kite that size to lift it all? I'll show you, replied Sim. He was unfastening the four bands as he spoke, and now he crossed them again over his little finger and moved them along till the kite swung under them, almost level. That'll do. Now I'll tie them hard and you can cut off your mayweed. There'll be tail enough without it. When I was in China... Was you ever in China? Yes, I was. That was when I was a sailor. I saw kites enough there. They spend money on them just as we do on horses. Make them all shapes and sizes. Don't need any tails. 
kites without tails? Well, some of them have, and some of them haven't. It's a knack of making them. I've seen one like a dragon and another like a big snake, and they floated perfectly. Only a thin silk string either. String's got to be strong enough to hold a kite, said Parley Hooker. Look at yours. Yes, mine's strong. It's made of fine hemp, but it isn't any heavier than yours. What do you want of a rope with a kite of that size? It isn't a rope. It's too heavy, though. Besides, you've tied pieces together with big knots in them. You can't send up any travelers. What's that? I'll show you. Some call them messengers. Just then, Parley exclaimed, Sim, Sim, mine's broke. It's coming down. Broke right in the middle, where you notched your big sticks together. Just where it needs to be strongest, said Joe knowingly. No, it doesn't. Look at mine. It was the biggest kite they had ever seen, and it came down square at the bottom. But it was not a great deal wider than Parley's. The curious part of it was the cross sticks and the four bands. What did he need of so many? So many, said Sim. Why, the bands take the strain of the wind. If you put it all on the sticks, they'll bend or break. Don't you see? There's a band tied every two inches, and they all come together out here in the center knot. It just balances on that. Your tail's a light one. It's long enough. And it spreads enough to catch the wind. It isn't the mere weight you want in a tail if your kite's balanced. The wind blows against the tail as hard as hard as anywhere else. Won't yours ever dive? Of course it will, with a cross puff of wind. But it'll come right up again. That won't happen very often. I'll send her up. You wait and see. The other kites were all up now except Parley's broken one. And most of them were cutting queer antics because, as Sim explained, their forebands were tied wrong and their tails did not fit them. The Chinese could teach us, but the way we make kites, there's as much in the tail as in anything else. Oh, but our kites are covered with paper, and you've put some old silk on yours. Of course I have. It isn't much heavier. The Chinese use thin paper that's as good as silk. It won't wet through. Wet? Oh, Sim, it looks as if a storm is coming now. So it did, and Sim's big kite was going up, up, up very fast, and he was letting the strong brown string run rapidly from a sort of reel he held in his hand. Pull in your kites, boys, shouted Parley. Let's cut for home. I want to see Sim fly his. You all pull in yours, and we'll go into the cattle shed. It's only a shower. I can fly mine from the door. The shed was close at hand, and the door was a wide one. In three minutes more, just as the first drops came down, there was quite a crowd of boys behind Sim, as he stood a little inside and watched his kite. His reel was almost empty now, and the big kite looked a good deal smaller when it started. How steady it is. It pulls hard, though. There comes the rain. Thunder and lightning, too. Sim had fastened his wooden reel against the doorpost on a hook that was there, but he kept his hand on the string. I declare, boys, feel of that. The string's wet, and it's making a lightning rod of itself. Parley and Joe and Bob and two or three others felt of it at once. Lightning? Why, Sim, said Bob. I know better than that. I've had an electric shock before. That's all it is, said Parley. Well, replied Sim, didn't you ever hear of Dr. Franklin? We're doing just what he did. He discovered electricity with a kite. A wet kite string was the first lightning rod there ever was in the world. Lightning, exclaimed Bob. Don't you bring any in here. I won't touch it again. Did lightning ever strike anybody when he was flying a kite? Asked Joe. Not that I ever heard of, said Sim. But it's 
beginning to pour hard. I'll reel in my kite till the storm's over. He unhooked his reel as he spoke, but it was well he took a good strong hold of it. The wind must have been blowing a gale up where the kite was, and the string was a very strong one for its size. I declare why. But the next, the boys knew Sim Vetter was out in the rain. With that kite tugging at him, he would not let go, and he could not stop himself, and the sloping pasture before him was all downhill. On he went, faster and faster, till his foot slipped, and down he went full length. He held on, though, like a good fellow, and there he lay in the wet grass, with the rain pouring upon him, tucking his best at his big kite. The wind lulled a little, and Sim began to work his reel, slowly at first, then faster, and about the time the rain stopped, the wind almost died out, and the wonderful kite came in. There isn't a stick of it broken, said Sim triumphantly, nor a four-band. That's because they were made right, and put on so well they all help each other. Oh, but ain't you wet? exclaimed three or four boys at once. Well, yes, he was indeed very wet. End of section one. Section two of Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Twenty Five, April Twentieth, eighteen eighty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. Two Narrow Escapes by Uncle Ned One evening last winter the children call upon their Uncle Ned, who is a sailor and just home from India, for a story. He willingly granted their request and at once proceeded to tell them of a narrow escape he once made as follows. At the time of the occurrence, I was staying at a small village called Yela in India with a young friend in the civil service who had a bungalow there. We used to amuse ourselves picking up shells on the beach in the cool of the evening and later sitting out enjoying the breeze and smoking our sheer roots. One evening, however, our conversation was interrupted by a herd of buffaloes rushing past us at full speed, which we imputed to their being chased by a tiger. On the following morning, our surmise proved correct and we learned that a tiger had carried off a buffalo within two or three hundred yards of where we had been sitting on the previous evening. My friend, who was a keen sportsman, resolved to track the tiger, and I accompanied him with a number of natives who took care to keep at a safe distance in the rear. Following the broad track through the jungle, we soon arrived at the spot to which the tiger had dragged his prey, and here we found the mangled remains of the buffalo. But the tiger had betaken himself elsewhere to enjoy his siesta after gorging himself. We proceeded on cautiously, but as the jungle got very thick and tangled, my friend decided it would be imprudent to proceed any further, and we halted. We brought the butts of our rifles to the ground, and being of a botanical turn, I stooped to pick up a flower. At that moment, a tremendous roar echoed through the forest and seemed to stun me. I staggered a little as if from a blow, but recovering myself, grasped my rifle, for I immediately guessed it was the tiger. My friend, with an exclamation, what an escape, dashed away to the right, and I was about to follow, 
I knew not exactly whither when he made his appearance to my intense satisfaction. His first exclamation was, The brute has got away, just like my luck. And then he added, What a lucky escape you had. What do you mean? said I. Why, don't you know that, as you stooped down to pick the flower, that tiger sprang at you and missed you by a few inches? I confess a cold sweat broke out over me, and I inwardly thanked the Almighty for my providential escape. As my story is rather a short one, I will tell you another of a lucky escape I witnessed though first i should mention that soon after this affair my friend paid with his life for the temerity with which he tracked tigers in the jungle the brig to which i belonged was proceeding from rangoon and one evening after having come to an anchor abreast of a small inlet just above elephant creek at the mouth of the irrawaddy i accompanied the skipper and a friend in the boat up the inlet to a small village to procure a supply of fruit on our return my companions expressed their determination to bathe but as i did not feel inclined to do so i seated myself in the stern and taking out of my pocket one of scott's novels amused myself with reading until they should have completed their bath about five minutes had elapsed and the skipper was alone in the water when my attention was aroused by shouts and screams from the villagers who were hurrying down to the water's edge turning round i saw my captain for whom i had no great affection exerting every muscle to gain the bank from which he was still at a considerable distance not seeing anything to account for the hubbub my first impression was that a child had fallen into the water and that he was swimming to the spot of the accident to save it in an instant i directed the lascars to give way with the oars and seizing the helm steered as nearly as i could guess in the direction to which the gestures of the burmese appeared to point before i reached the point the skipper disappeared beneath the water but full of the preconceived impression i imagined that he was diving in search of the child a few strokes and we were at the spot but it was not until the lascar crew lashed their oars violently into the water that the truth flashed upon me it must be an alligator that was pursuing him and soon all doubt was removed when the master a few minutes later rose at a short distance from us in a spot where he could feel the bottom and ran quickly ashore his shoulder bleeding profusely the whole transaction occupied a very short time and the wounded master was conveyed on board the brig with all dispatch on inquiry i learned that the alligator had been first seen by the burmese who gave instant notice of his approach as before described and the warning was as quickly comprehended by the captain all his exertions to escape were however unavailing and he felt himself seized a little below the shoulder by a convulsive effort he succeeded in shaking off his cruel antagonist and again struck out the animal however again advanced and seizing him nearly by the same place dragged him under the surface for an instant or two when the splashing of the oars compelled him to relax his hold on examination it proved that the arm although severely lacerated was not so much injured as to incur the necessity of amputation and being placed under medical care at rangoon the skipper was soon enabled to resume his duties end of section two
Section 3 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. Section 3. Begun in number 19 of Harper's Young People, March 9th. Across the Ocean, or A Boy's First Voyage, A True Story, by J.O. Davidson. Chapter 7. Towed by a Whale. "'Have you ever seen a whaler, lad?' asked old Herrick as Frank came on deck the next morning. "'Well, here's one for you now, anyway.' There, sure enough, on the very edge of the great weed prairie, which was now almost left behind, lay a large vessel, with her sails hanging loosely against the masts. Alongside of her floated a huge black and white mass, which a second glance showed to be the carcass of a whale while the thick black smoke that rose from between her masts told that the work of trying out the oil was going briskly forward. This was just the sight for Austin, who, in the long winter evenings at home, had devoured every account and engraving of the whale fishery that he could lay his hands on. He was still gazing, even when Herrick touched his arm. "'See them two boats yonder, my boy? They've struck another whale, or my name ain't Herrick.' The whaler's boats were about three miles off, pulling as if for life and death." The other end of the line attached to each was under water, but the disturbance of the surface showed that some large object was in violent motion below. Suddenly both crews backed water, while a man leaped into the bow of each boat, axe in hand, ready to cut the rope should the whale attempt to drag them under. The next moment the huge black body broke through the seething foam with a lash of its tail, which, as Herrick said, sounded like a church tower a fallen flat on an acre of planks. In flew the boats, one on each side. Up sprang the harpooners, whiz went the well-aimed weapons, and the wounded whale, giving a leap that set the whole sea boiling, turned and came right down upon the Arizona, as if taking it for the assailant. Frank turned pale in spite of himself, for the charge of this moving mountain seemed able to crush the strongest ship like an eggshell. But just as it was about to strike the bow, the monster turned again and made for the distant whaler, towing the two boats after it with the speed of a locomotive. "'Boy, for you, mates!' shouted a harpooner as they flew past. "'You've turned the critter for us, and now she'll tow us aboard without our pulling a stroke!' On the sixteenth night of the voyage, Frank was sitting on the forehatch, admiring the brightness of the moon. Eight bells, 8 p.m., had just been struck, when the ship's officers were seen crowding together on the afterdeck with an appearance of considerable excitement. Before anyone could guess what was the matter, one of the men uttered a cry of astonishment and pointed upward. The moonlight had become suddenly obscured, not by Mr. Clouds, but by a huge circular shadow, which moved steadily across the bright disk, blotting it out inch by inch. "'It's a clip, that's what it is,' said one, and I heard Mr. Hawkins say this minute as some feller ashore months and months ago said it had come this very day and hour. Queer, isn't it, for a landlubber to be so cute?' The darkness steadily increased, till the men could barely see each other's faces, and with the unnatural gloom a solemn silence fell upon one and all. Not a word was spoken, not a sound heard, save the rush of the steamer through the great waste of black waters. But the return of the light at length unchained all tongues, and many a quaint comment was made upon what they had just seen. "'Guess the moon's got on one side bright and t'other dark, and when she slews round she brings the dark part broadside on.' That much I reckon it's them wet clouds going backer and forward over her that spile or polish same way as the spray rusts or bilers. Shouldn't wonder, for a book lard feller told me once that the sun itself saw black inside, and them spots you see on him's just the black a showin' through the gildin', like a darky skin through the holes in his shirt. The signs of their approach to land now became unmistakable. The sea took a greenish tinge, numerous vessels were seen heading the same way as themselves, and various birds, of a kind never met far from shore, came fluttering around them. Frank, too much excited to go below, perched himself in the rigging, and strained his eyes to catch the earliest glimpse of Europe. But Africa came first, in the shape of the Tangier light. Nor was it till 4 a.m. that the haze lifted, and a huge dark mass was seen looming on the port bow, the sight of which made the boy's heart leap, for it was the Rock of Gibraltar. As the dawn brightened, all the grand features of the scene came forth in their full splendor. The long purple range of the African mountains, ending in the bold headland of Ceuta, far away to the southeast, the wide blue sweep of the bay, with the dainty little white town of al painted on it, like an ivory carving, the flat sandy neck of neutral ground between the rock and the mainland, with all its countless memories of war, from the old world battles of the Spaniard and Saracen, to the day when the combined fleets of France and Spain swept it with the fire of 1,800 cannon. 
the bristling masts of the harbor, the long gray curve of Europa Point, the mighty fortress itself, with the narrow eyes of leveled cannon peering watchfully through the terraced rocks that loomed against the bright morning sky like a thundercloud, the blue Spanish hills wave beyond wave, melting at last into the warm, dreamy horizon, and right in front the white houses of Gibraltar huddled together along the base of the cliff, as if, to quote old Herrick, They'd been playing slow sled and all slid down in a heap. All were there. To get into Gibraltar Harbor is no easy matter, but the Arizona, following in the wake of an English mail steamer, reached her berth at last, and had barely cast anchor when she was surrounded by a perfect fleet of shore boats, freighted with oranges, figs, bananas, coconuts, monkeys, parrots, and everything else that any sailor could be expected to buy. The screams of the parrots, the chattering of the monkeys, the bumping of the boats against each other, the clatter of the oars, the angry outcries of the boatmen in Spanish and broken English whenever a monkey or a parrot fell overboard or a fruit basket got upset made a deafening uproar. An English man of war, anchored close by, was similarly beset, and a mischievous sailor had just lassoed a monkey out of the nearest boat against with outrage both Jocko and his master were protesting with all the power of their lungs. Frank lost no time in buying a stock of oranges, and tossed a quarter to the tall, black-eyed boatman, whose embroidered jacket, brown handsome face, and a round flat hat with a jockey cockade on the side of it, made a very striking picture. The Spaniard rang it on a knife blade, tested it with a hard bite from his strong white teeth, and then tied it up in the handkerchief around his head, with a bow and a, Gracias, señor. Thanks, sir. Worthy of any grandee in Spain. What a fine fellow, cried Frank, enthusiastically. "'Aye, ain't he?' growled an old tar who overheard him. "'If I'd a loose tooth in my head, I'd yank it out for coming to here for fear of them, some of them fine fellers, would steal it.' "'You don't say. Fact, and that's why we never let none of them aboard. I guess the old saying's true enough. The Spanish wine steals all heads, the Spanish women steals all hearts, and the Spanish men steals everything.' The captain, purser, and doctor had gone ashore with the ship's papers, but to the no small dismay of the crew— who had expected a long stay in port, a signal was suddenly reported to up anchor at once. So the chain cable was passed around the capstan, the bars manned, for the convenient fashion of getting up the anchor by steam was not yet adopted by the Arizona, and to work they went. The slack of the chain came in easily enough, but to break the anchor out of the mud was a harder matter. Up came more men, up came even the trimmers and heavers from the engine room. The bars bent with a pressure of six sturdy fellows apiece, but the anchor never budged. The perspiration rolled down the bronze faces of the sailors, and their brawny chests heaved like bellows with a strain, but all to no purpose. Suddenly, a flaw of the wind made the vessel heel, bringing more pressure on the chain. The crew made a desperate effort and seemed about to conquer when snap went a bar. The capstan spun back, the men were dashed along the deck like nine pins, and one poor fellow, jammed in between the chain and the hawse pipe, had his hand cut in two as if by an axe. "'Hello, Yankee Doodle!' shouted a voice from the British ship. "'Can't get you up your mud hook, eh? Shall we send a boy down to lift it for you?' Frank's eyes flashed fire at the taunts, and the roar of laughter that followed. Forgetting everything in the passion of the moment, he sprang upon the capstan and shouted, "'Mates, are we going to let that Britisher laugh at us? Not much! Come, all together now!' The excited men answered with a deafening cheer and bent to their work like giants. One tremendous heave, and up came the anchor at last. Round and round they spun, leaping over the cable, which was now coming rapidly in, and while Frank cheered and waved his cap like a madman, they ran the anchor up chock-a-block, just as Captain Gray and his officers came up the side. To be continued. End of section 3《Of Harper's Young People》Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Delaney High Key Club Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20, 1880 The Royal Blacksmith There was born one day, in the grandest palace that ever the sun shone upon, a child whose life was for many years a sad and weary one. 
he was a cripple from his birth. And the queen, his mother, whose heart was so full of pride that there was no room left in it for love, hated the innocent babe and refused to take him in her arms. He, poor fellow, would no doubt have been as handsome as any of us if he had been consulted about the matter. But as no one asked him whether he would prefer being ugly or beautiful, he could hardly have been to blame for coming into the world with one leg longer than the other. The queen, however, did not stop to think of this. The longer she looked at him, the more angry she became, until at last, when no one was looking, she snatched him from his cradle and threw him out the window. Down through the blue air fell the baby boy, still down and down till he reached the sea. Stretching out their arms as if to welcome such a royal playfellow, the waves clapped their white hands until the little prince crowed and cooed for joy. Far away beneath the waves lived two nymphs named Urino and Thetis, who, when they had heard what had happened, decided to adopt the child. Hastening to his assistance, Thetis took him in her arms, and the two hurried along under the sea until they reached the home which they had made for themselves in one of the loveliest of the ocean caverns. Here the boy lived for many years, but he could not forget his old home among the mountains of Olympus. I shall never be happy, he said to himself, until I regain my rightful place among the sons of Zeus. He had already displayed great skill in carving, and the little grotto of Thetis was like a piece of wonderland, fitted and furnished with all manner of curious ornaments made by the lame boy of Pistis. As he grew older, he resolved to turn his talents to account, so he made friends with the old man of the sea, an elderly gentleman of uncertain temper, who spent his time in sailing over the ocean in an enormous shell drawn by seahorses. To him, Hephaestus brought a trident, hoping that the gift would induce him to offer the young exile his assistance in making peace with the queen. Now this trident was a magical three-pronged spear, with which the owner could steal the waves in their wildest fury. It was therefore almost invaluable to the old sailor, but although he accepted the gift and praised the workmanship, he forgot to thank the workmen and sailed grandly away. It was not long after this that the lame prince, walking one day through the woods, fell in with a band of wandering musicians. Some were dancing, others were singing, and as he examined them more closely, he saw that they had legs and hoofs and even long ears like goats. While he stood looking with wondering eyes at these fantastic beings, the leader of the band suddenly approached him and said, What aileth thee, my brother? Tell me thy trouble, that I may make thee glad again, for I cannot abide a sorrowful countenance. I am called Hephaestus, replied the prince, but I know not who you may be to call me brother. You will be wiser when you are older, laughed his new friend. It is enough for you to know now that I am a son of Zeus. But I like not the solemn grandeur of the court, so I live in the woods, keeping holiday all the year. These fawns and satyrs are my friends, and if you will join our company, I can promise you a merry life and a long one. 
but Hephaestus shook his head. I can never be happy, he said, until I have won the love of the Queen Mother. To do that, I must show her that I have gifts quite as valuable as beauty. But I have no one to plead my cause, and I, alas, do not know the way to Olympus. If that is all your trouble, answered the merry man of the woods, set your heart at rest, for I myself will present you at court. With these words, the good-natured Bacchus drew the skin of a wild beast over his shoulders, and the two travelers became the best of friends as they journeyed together along the road which lies between the wooded heights where the satyrs dance to the hill where the Olympian palace hides half its fozy towers among the clouds. The queen at first would not recognize her son. The happy prince hung his head, and the assembled courtiers laughed long and loud at the awkward silence of the youth. Bacchus, however, was not to be frightened by laughter, however inextinguishable, and he pleaded his brother's cause so well that the queen finally consented to overlook his ugliness and ordered that a palace be built for him. All I ask, said the prince, is a workshop, a pair of bellows, and a forge. Then you are not my son, after all, exclaimed the queen. You are nothing but a poor blacksmith. Tis true, I am a blacksmith, he answered, but I will show you that I am no common workman. Concealing her astonishment, the queen ordered his request to be granted, and her feastus, glad but silent, limped away. Day after day found him at his work, and at length one morning, when the king and queen were sitting in their banqueting hall, the doors were thrown open, and there appeared at each entrance a golden table laden with nectar and ambrosia. One by one, the tables walked across the hall as if they had been alive, and close behind followed Hephaestus, supported on either side by lovely maidens, fashioned like the tables out of gold. To the king he presented a golden spectre and thunderbolts, which no one but Zeus himself could hold. Thou art indeed our son, cried the king. Choose what thou wilt, and it shall be given thee. Looking around the court, the eyes of Hephaestus rested at last on Venus, a princess so beautiful that she was supposed to have been made of sea foam. Grant me, O Zeus, that I may have this lady for my wife, said Hephaestus. The request was granted almost before it was asked, and the wedding which followed was one of the most brilliant that had ever taken place in the country of Olympus. Venus, however, was as false as she was beautiful, and Hephaestus was often unhappy, but he consoled himself as best he could by keeping perpetually at work, sometimes making a brazen shield for one friend or forging a suit of armor for another. So it came to pass that the lame boy Hephaestus, exiled from his father's court on account of his ugliness, became the world-renowned royal blacksmith, honored by all for his patient endurance of wrong, for his matchless skill, and for his loving service. End of section 4. The Royal Blacksmith. Section 5 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. Section 5. The Blue Grotto by James B. Marshall. 
Did you ever see any blue-colored people? asked Miss Bertha, age 10, shortly after my introduction to that young lady at Naples. I was forced to confess that though my acquaintances had shaded from white to black and brown to red, I had never been fortunate enough to boast of a blue one. Oh, I saw most a hundred the other day, she said triumphantly. Then did you see a silver-colored man? A silver-colored man? Miss Bertha, dear, I have an idea that you have been to fairyland. He was a real silver-colored man, said she very earnestly. I suppose he was the king of the fairyland you went to? Oh, no, he wasn't. He was a big boatman, but it was just like fairyland. It was splendid, really just splendid. It proved that dear little enthusiasts had been a few days previous on a visit to the island of Capri to see the famous Blue Grotto, since which she had been startling people with her descriptions of blue folks in a silver man. Seeing that I couldn't have a better guide than Miss Bertha, the next morning we and a jovial party went on board of the tiny steamer that plies between Naples and the 18 miles distant island of Capri. Hollowed under the cliffs of which the Blue Grotto is situated. The Bay of Naples, you know, is called the most beautiful in the world. And a sail across it is a lovely thing in itself. There are such glorious blue skies overhead and such clear blue waters underneath that the steamer appears to bear one through the air between two skies. Then close to Naples is seen that wonderful volcano, Vesuvius, which always a cloud of smoke curling lazily out of its crater. And besides the White House of Naples, are so built on a hillside, the streets climbing to the top, that a few miles away that, too, is a handsome sight. Miss Bertha told me that they were the marble steps to the giant's palace, whose bird was carrying us to the enchanted island to show us the giant's jewel room. Capri then looked like a distant lighthouse, merely a brown rock rising out of the sea. As we went bobbling over the waves, it grew higher and higher, which Miss Bertha explained was the correct thing for it to do. Until the steamer anchored a little distance from its cliffs, it rose straight up from the water to a dizzy height. A flock of little skiffs crowded around the steamer for the passengers, and Miss Bertha, taking charge of me, led me into one. But the grotto, where is it? I asked, staring at the huge cliffs, straight at which our red-sashed boatman was rowing us as if to destruction. Skiff after skiff ahead of us seemed to be swallowed up in the cliffs in the most amazing way, and not an opening in the rocky wall to be seen. You mustn't be afraid, said my sweet little guide assuringly. It won't hurt. And she gave me her hand that, perhaps I shouldn't tell, trembled a little, and directly its mate stole my grasp. Lie down low, said our boatman, when the skiff was within a few feet of apparently smashing against the cliff. And shut your eyes tight, said Miss Bertha, screwing up her eyes so tight that she showed all her pretty white teeth in the funniest way. The skiff scratched and bumped on the rocks a few times, then floated clear. The bright sky was gone, the gulls flying about the cliffs were gone, the steamer was gone, and the cliffs themselves were gone. We had slipped under them, through a tiny opening, and were in the blue grotto. The blue roof rose high above us, and there was ample room within the grotto, for many times the numerous blue skiffs filled with blue-haired blue people, all dressed in blue clothes and breathing blue air. That is just the way we appeared. The water was lighter colored than the air, and when a boatman jumped overboard, his every action being distinctly seen, he seemed to be flying in air and not diving in water. 
It gave one a weird, crawly feeling to see him. And when he came to the surface, it seemed to be the most natural thing for him to tumble back to us after capering around in the sky. Then he crawled out on a rock to allow the water to drain off his clothes. And then it was that Miss Bertha's promise of a silver man was made good. He stood there a moment, appearing like a burnished silver statue. And the trickling drops, as they fell from him, sparkled with silvery glitter. And oars splashed in the water, sent the drops flying into the air, to glimmer there in silver brightness a moment, like a patch of the starry Milky Way on a frosty night. Isn't it lovely, said Bertha, clapping her hands joyfully. And you can get a whole handful of silver by just reaching for it, but you can't keep it. She grasped the blue water as she spoke, and it escaped through her fingers in glittering drops, as if a handful of coins was melting in her palm. Whatever is held in the water assumes, for the time, the silver color, and the blades of the oars shone as though the Capri boatmen were so rich that they had made them of pure silver. For hundreds of years, the grotto was known to exist somewhere under the cliffs of the island, but so small is the entrance that it was not rediscovered until this century. It cannot be entered except the sea around the island is very calm, and as all the beautiful effects are due to refraction of light, the bright midday sun should be shining without. End of section 5. Section 6 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20, 1880. THE ALBATROSS Far away in the desolate South Seas, there lives a large and beautiful bird called the albatross, the giant member of the petrel family. The wandering albatross, Diamedia excellens, is the largest of its tribe. Specimens have been captured measuring four feet in length and with an expanse of wing from ten to fourteen feet. The body of this bird is very large. Its neck is short and stout, and its head is armed with a powerful hooked beak from six to eight inches long. It is snowy, glistening white, its long wing feathers tipped with black. Its mighty strength of wing renders it the admiration of all navigators, who fitly name it the Lord of the Stormy Seas. In the desolate regions where it lives, the sailors hail its appearance with delight, as it comes sailing around the ship with majestic, careless flight, rising, sinking, now swooping down to seize some cast-off mouthful of food, now poising high above the masthead, moving with the ship at the most rapid speed, and yet with scarcely a perceptible movement of its gigantic wings. In storm or calm the albatross is master of the wind and waves, sailors straining every nerve to guide the laboring, struggling ship through tempestuous seas, look up and see far above their heads the albatross calmly breasting the gale its majesty unruffled, and its great outstretched wings as motionless as on a still sunny day. Its strength of flight is marvelous, and it is said to be superior to that of any other bird. Sailors have captured these royal inhabitants of southern polar regions, and marked their glistening breasts with spots of tar, that they might distinguish them and determine their power of endurance. And in several instances, the same bird has followed a ship under full sail before the wind for seven days and longer, circling round and round, and apparently taking no rest, its sharp eye always watchful for any refuse of food cast overboard by the sailors. The albatross is very voracious and easily caught, as it is neither cunning nor shy. As it lives in desolation and has little to do with men, it knows nothing of trickery, nor dreams of the plots laid against its royal freedom. An interesting account is given of the capture of an albatross by an officer of a French ship. It was a sunny, windy day, 
and the vessel was speeding along near the dreary tierra de fuego when a great shadow like a cloud passed over the deck on looking up the officer saw an immense albatross its white breast glistening like snow floating aloft with widespread wings wishing to examine the bird more closely he gave orders for its capture fastening a piece of fat pork to a strong hook attached to a line a sailor threw it overboard and allowed full forty yards of cord to run out the albatross soon described the tempting morsel and sweeping down in graceful circles to seize it it was soon securely hooked the only show of resistance it made to being drawn on board was to extend its wings and utter loud discordant cries once on deck its grace and majesty vanished it showed no fear and the hook still fastened in its beak did not seem to annoy it but no landsman could have been more awkward than was the albatross on the smooth rocking deck it staggered and waddled clumsily and tried in vain to lift itself with its wings it showed considerable temper and snapped furiously at all who approached and the captain's dog which came trotting up full of curiosity over the strange visitor received a terrible blow from the hooked beak which sent him howling with pain to the most distant corner of the deck as the officer was desirous to preserve the beak breast wings and feet of this magnificent creature as souvenirs he ordered the sailors to kill it although he states that it impressed him as though he were commanding the execution of some royal personage the albatross is an expert swimmer and floats on the waves like a piece of cork riding in undisturbed serenity over the lofty foaming crests of stormy billows it is not however a good diver and is obliged to subsist on whatever food comes to the surface it might be called the vulture of the seas for dead fish floating carcasses of whales and other sea refuge form its main diet the habits of the albatross during the breeding season are still partially veiled in mystery as the desolate mossy headlands of tristan de cuna inaccessible island and other lands lying far to the southward where the albatross makes its nest are visited only at rare intervals the island of tristan is circular and almost entirely volcanic and on the summit of its cliffs which rise a thousand feet above the sea on broad dreary plains of dark gray lava the albatrosses gather some time during november and prepare themselves nests selecting some space free from the tussock grass the bird scrapes together a circle of dried grass and clay in which it lays one egg about the size of a swan's white with a band of small brick red spots round one end but few naturalists have been able to visit these great breeding warrens and none have determined how the albatross lives and feeds its young during its absence from the ocean it is certain that the great bird rarely leaves its nest for there is a wicked little robber gull ever on the watch to break and eat the egg should the mother bird desert it for a moment the young when hatched are snow white and covered with a soft woolly down a traveller once climbed up the dangerous precipice of tristan de cuna and saw these young helpless things lying in the nests while several hundred pair of parent birds were stalking awkwardly about they all snapped their beaks with a great noise and ejected from them an offensive oil their only means of defence the same traveller visited the place five months later when he found all the young albatrosses sitting in their nests as before but the old birds had all disappeared it is supposed that an albatross may be a year old before it can fly and as the parents depart some time in april for their ocean hunting grounds and are never seen to return until the breeding season again comes round it is astonishing what feeds and supports the young until they are able to hunt for themselves naturalists wonder over this point and advance many different theories but as yet no facts have been discovered in regard to the diet of the young and helpless bird the albatross was formerly regarded with superstitious reverence by sailors who considered this majestic companion which came around the ship in desolate icy seas as a bird of good omen and to kill one was considered a crime that would surely be punished by disaster and shipwreck coleridge the english poet has written a wonderful poem on this superstition called the rhyme of the ancient mariner to which gustave dore a french artist 
has drawn a series of illustrations picturing the lonely frozen ocean and the majestic lordly albatross which the unhappy sailor shot with his crossbow thereby bringing misfortune and death on the goodly ship and his crew end of section six section seven of harper's young people volume one issue twenty five april twentieth eighteen eighty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by michelle hannah harper's young people volume one issue twenty five april twentieth eighteen eighty a Bear Story by Emily H. Leland A good many years ago, when the century was young, there came to live in the big forest of northern Vermont a man and his wife and their little boy. Partly because they liked to be high up out of the fogs and damp, and partly because there was little else but hilly land in that part of the country, they built their cabin at the top of a nice baby mountain which was covered at the back with an immense orchard of maples and butternuts, but which was quite bare and steep at the east side, and had rocks cropping out which the farmer thought would be fine for building a good stone house with some day. It was long, hard work, starting a farm in a place where there was nothing but woods. But after a year or so had passed by, and enough trees had been cleared away to make room for a cornfield and a potato patch, and a little chicken house and cow shed had been added to their log cabin. The young farmer used to sit down before their rough stone fireplace, with its bright crackling fire, and trot his boy to sleep upon his knee, while he watched the pretty young mamma putting away the supper things, thinking all the time what a rich and happy man he was. And when at last a pig pen was joined to the cow shed, and two cunning little pink-nosed pigs had been bought of a neighbor five miles away and placed in it he felt richer and grander than many a man does nowadays who owns a railroad and how they grew those pink-nosed pigs they had a southern exposure good drainage plenty of dry leaves and moss for bedding and an abundance of milk with an occasional handful of cracked corn or a pint of mashed potatoes how could they help growing? The farmer took great delight in feeding them, and his wife would sometimes ask him with a laugh, Now, Stephen, which do you love the most, the pigs or our little Lisha? Elisha was the baby's name. They hadn't thought of such names as Carl and Claude and Clarence in those days. One fine moonlit night, late in the fall, after the corn had been husked and carried into the loft, and some of the big yellow pumpkins had been cut into strips and hung on long poles near the kitchen ceiling to dry, and others had been stored away for the cows' luncheons and the Thanksgiving pies, and the potatoes were safe in the cellar, and the onions hung in long strings above the mantel shelf. This young farmer covered up the glowing coals in the fireplace with ashes, so they would keep bright and hot for the morning fire, and went to bed, feeling quite well prepared for winter, for he had had that day banked the house clear up to its queer little windows and made the cow shed and pig pen and hen house very cozy with loads of hemlock and spruce boughs. He was just dozing off to sleep when all at once there sounded through the still, frosty air a long and terrible squeal from the pig pen. The farmer did not wait for it to end, but bounced out of bed tore away the clumsy fastening of the door and rushed out with a war whoop that could have been heard a mile away if there had been anybody to hear it as he rushed he caught up a cornstalk that happened to lie in his way a cornstalk was a foolish thing for him to pick up but people seldom stop to think twice in such moments he was around by the pig pen in no time and there he saw a great burly something just lifting out one of his dear little pigs over the top of the pen. He rushed upon him and struck him over the head with the cornstalk. There was a joint in the cornstalk nearly as hard as a crust of bread, and the something seemed to almost feel it through his thick fur, 
for he turned around and looked at the farmer as if saying, What do you want of me? And there he was, a great, black, full-grown bear. Drop him! Drop him! yelled the farmer, and he brought the cornstalk down upon the bear's nose. The bear dropped the pig very quickly, but he grabbed the man in place of it, and then commenced a grand wrestling match. The farmer was a strong man, and he was fighting for the right. The bear was strong, too, and being a little tired of wild honey and beech nuts, he had made up his mind to have a little spring pig for his family's supper. As they pushed and pulled this way and that, the bear tripped against a stump, and down they came, bear and man, to the ground. And being near the steep hillside, in about ten seconds, they began rolling down, over and over, and faster and faster, bumping over rocks and hummocks, but never letting go and never stopping until the bottom of the hill was reached. And then, up got Mr. Bear, and made off down the valley at a slow trot, never stopping to say, Good night, or anything. And up got the farmer, and scrambled up the hill as fast as his bruised legs could carry him, and feeling of his ribs as he went, expecting to find half a dozen of them at least punching out through his nightgown. But they were not. At the door, he was met by his wife, keeping guard with the birch broom over her sleeping boy. Oh, Stephen, what was it? she said in a shivering whisper. Oh, nothing but a bear, nothing but a bear, said the farmer. But the little pig slept in the hen house for the rest of the night, and the next day they had a stout log roof built over their heads. End of section 7「Section 8 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. Professional Divers One of the diver's earliest experiences is a disagreeable, roaring sensation in the ears for some time after his first descent, but this is little felt after he becomes accustomed to his work. It is caused by the air pressure, which increases with depth. From the same cause, the diver often experiences a sensation amounting to earache, which any one may test for himself by descending in a diving bell. With regard to the mode of working, it is noteworthy that, instead of moving gradually outward after reaching the bottom, the diver usually gropes at once to the full length of his tether in the required direction, and then works slowly back to the starting point. He considers this the safer method, partly because it leaves him at the finish directly at the place whence he has to rise. The length of time during which a diver can remain underwater depends very much upon his own strength and experience, the steady care with which the air pump is managed, and other circumstances. M. Frendenberg states that in the repair of the well in the Charlie Zinc Mines in Silesia, two divers descended to a depth of 85 feet, remaining down for periods varying from 15 minutes to 2 hours. Sieb, another authority on the subject, relates that in removing the cargo of the ship Cape Horn, wrecked off the coast of South America, a diver named Hooper made seven descents to a depth of no less than 201 feet, and at one time remained down 42 minutes, supposed to be the greatest diving feat ever achieved. Joe by Mrs. Margaret Sangster Bright brown eyes and tangled hair, rosy cheeks beneath the tan, fearless head on shoulders square, that is Joe, the little man, helping mother all he can. Father is away at sea, oh, the vessel tarries long, lonely would the cottage be, many a weary day go wrong, but for Joe, 
with shout and song. Rough the weather, fierce the gales, wild the nights upon the shore. Oft the dear wife's courage fails when she hears the breakers roar, lest her sailor come no more. Joe, with lion heart and leal, tells her it is safe outside, that the deep sea does not feel all the troubles of the tide, that the good ship safe will ride. Mother heeds her comforter. He is only eight years old, but his earnest words to her are as rubies set in gold, precious with a worth untold. Mr. Thompson and the Bumblebee by Alan Foreman Buzz, 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 scolded old Mr. Bumblebee, flying around Mr. Thompson's head. Mr. Thompson didn't understand him, however, and only brushed at him impatiently and said, Get out, in a tone anything but sociable. But the old bee kept flying around just the same and complained in his drowsy voice. Buzz, buzz, buzz. I wish you would go away. I want to get into my house, and I don't want you to see me. My family are in there, and we are making bread today. And unless I get home with the flour, my wife will scold awfully. Buzz, buzz, buzz. But in the meantime, Mr. Thompson had fallen asleep, and the old bee sat down on the fence rail and watched him. Hum, 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 he murmured. I guess that he has gone to sleep. I don't see what men want to stay awake for anyway. They are not half so much trouble when they are asleep. And only listen how nicely he can buzz through his nose. He really seems to be quite like a sensible bee. Now Mr. Thompson says he did not go to sleep at all. He says that he only closed his eyes, and in a few minutes he could understand every word that the old bee said. He's a pleasant-looking man, buzzed the bee. I wonder if he likes honey. Mr. Thompson answered through his nose that he was very fond of it. Sensible too, said the bee, who thought, all bumblebees do, that anybody who agreed with him must be sensible. Then, turning to Mr. Thompson, the bee murmured in a more pleasant hum, If you like honey, try some of this. As he said it, he alit on Mr. Thompson's lips, and pressed some of the honey he had with him into his mouth. Mr. Thompson began to grow smaller as he shrunk in size. His light alpaca duster became gauzy and formed itself into wings. Just as he had begun to wonder how long it would take him to shrink into nothing, the bee said, there, I guess that will do. Mr. Thompson stretched himself and found, to his surprise, that he was in reality nothing more than a large black bumblebee. He shook his wings, arose, and, flying around for a few moments, settled on the fence rail. He has since told me that if it is true, as Mr. Darwin says, that men were evolved from the lower orders of animals, they made the greatest mistake of their lives when they left off their wings. Well, remarked the old bee, you look quite presentable. Won't you drop in and take dinner with me? My wife would be delighted to see you. Mr. Thompson thought how much he resembled a certain highly respectable old gentleman who was wont to invite his friends to his humdrum dinners and buzz them unmercifully in the same drowsy way. But, as he did not like to offend his new friend, he answered, politely, that he would be most happy, and followed him under the rail into a round hole that was the door of the bumblebee's house. They entered a long cylindrical corridor, or, as the old bee expressed it, arched at the top, sides, and floor. It was lined with the fibres of the wood, and was as soft as velvet. After walking some distance along the hall, they reached a part where it widened into a sort of parlour, where Mrs. Bumblebee was seated, resting from the labour of bread-making. Well, you are home at last, she buzzed angrily. I'll be bound you forgot the flower. Why, my dear, don't you see it? I have it here, 
answered Mr. B, soothingly pointing to two little yellow bundles on his legs. After greeting her guest, Mrs. B excused herself on the score of domestic duties and busied herself in carrying the flower, or pollen, into the corridor above. Soon she returned, and after they had made a meal of bee bread and honey, Mr. Bumblebee proposed to show his guest through his mansion. They passed through several long corridors, so constructed that the rain could not beat into the living rooms, as Mr. B explained. One end of one of the upper galleries was securely walled up, and in another compartment lay three or four worm-like insects, almost covered with bee bread. What's this room used for? inquired Mr. Thompson. This is the nursery, answered Mr. B proudly. Ah, indeed. And what are those white, ugly-looking grubs? Mr. B looked aghast for a moment, but his surprise quickly turned into indignation as he buzzed angrily. Grubs? Grubs? Ugly-looking grubs? Those, sir, are my children, sir, and I flatter myself that a more charming family does not exist. Grubs, forsooth! Out of my house, base insulter! And before Mr. Thompson could apologise, Mr. B had pushed him out and stung him on the end of his nose. He fell, and as he dropped from the rail, he began to grow larger, and when he reached the ground, he had assumed his natural proportions. He found himself lying in the same place beside the fence that he had occupied when the bee first spoke to him. When he related the story to his friends, someone suggested that he had dreamed the whole adventure. He gently touched his inflamed and swelled nose, and answered in a grieved tone, I suppose I dreamed this too. This argument was unanswerable and Mr. Thompson is now engaged in writing a lecture on the habits and customs of the bumblebee. Among other things, he says, Bumblebees only consider those people sensible who agree with them. And again, bumblebees invariably think their own children the most beautiful and interesting creatures in existence. Which facts, if they are true, show the great superiority of men over bumblebees. End of section 8 Read by Jason Yemenidzis. Section 9 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Hanna Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880 The Story of George Washington by Edward Carey, Chapter 2 After the close of the French and Indian War, Washington, then in his 27th year, married Mrs. Martha Custis and settled down to a Virginia planter's life at Mount Vernon. His neighbors elected him again and again to the House of Burgesses of the colony, a body much like one of our state legislators. Here, he did not talk much, but he kept close watch of matters and knew, as nearly as he could, all the facts that were needed to make up his mind, so that he had a good deal of weight with other members, and yet was very modest. When he first took his seat in the House, the Speaker was directed to thank him in the name of the people, for his great services as an officer. This the speaker did in glowing terms, quite unexpectedly to Washington. Washington rose to reply, his face flushed, he struggled to speak, but could only stammer and stood speechless and trembling. Sit down, Mr. Washington, said the speaker with a smile. Your modesty equals your valor, and that surpasses the power of any language that I possess. After Washington had been some ten years at Mount Vernon, looking forward to the peaceful and easy life of a wealthy farmer, certain things happened which seemed then of small account, but which were to lead to a great change in his career. The government of Great Britain undertook to raise money in America for use on the other side of the ocean. This government was made up of the king and the parliament, and the parliament was for the most part chosen by the people of England. 
the people of America were not allowed to choose any of its members. And when the British government declared that the Americans would raise money for it, the Americans had no one to vote for them or speak for them on that question. They thought this was not fair. They were willing to pay the expenses of their own governments because they had some voice in them, but they would not help pay the expenses of the British government in which they had no voice. The British government passed an act which said that every written promise to pay money must be upon stamped paper, which could only be got by buying it from British officers. If the promise was not on this kind of paper, the man who signed it need not pay. The British thought this would bring in a good deal of money, but the Americans would not use the stamped paper. They seized that which was sent over and burned it. Other kind of taxes were tried, but the Americans would pay none of them. Washington took the side of his countrymen with great zeal. He wrote to a friend, I think the Parliament of Great Britain have no more right to put their hands into my pocket without my consent than I have to put my hands into yours. But the British government insisted and sent over troops to Boston to try and force the people to submit. Washington was one of a number who proposed that a Congress, or great meeting, should be called to arrange for resisting the taxes, and he was chosen to go to the Congress, which was held in Philadelphia in September 1774. Meanwhile, more soldiers were sent over. An attempt was made on the 19th of April, 1775, to seize some powder which the Americans had at Concord near Boston, and the result was the Battle of Lexington, where a good many Americans were killed but where the British soldiers were finally driven back. Large numbers of men took their guns and gathered at Boston to watch the British troops and keep them in the city. They came from Massachusetts and the other colonies called New England, from Connecticut and Rhode Island, and from New Hampshire and Maine. The Congress came together again in May 1775, and Washington was also there. The Battle of Lexington had been heard of, and the people were everywhere angry and excited. The Congress resolved to resist all attempts by the British to force the country to submit. It called for troops and guns and powder from the various colonies. It adopted the soldiers around Boston as a part of the Continental Army, or the army of the whole country. It chose Washington as commander-in-chief to have the direction of all the soldiers. When this was made known to him, he thanked Congress for the honor, but he added, I beg it may be remembered by every gentleman in this room that I this day declare with the utmost sincerity I do not think myself equal to the command I am honored with. He also refused to take any pay for his services. I will keep an exact account of my expenses, he said. These I doubt not Congress will discharge, and that is all I desire. Washington hastened to Boston, learning of the Battle of Bunker Hill on the way. He found some 17,000 men around Boston and took command of them on the 3rd of July, under a great elm tree on the common in the village of Cambridge. He was then 43 years old and a very tall and fine-looking man. His features were large. His eyes were of pure blue, usually grave, but full of kindness and at times very merry. His manners were gentle, but full of dignity, and they often seemed very cold to those not well acquainted with him, though at heart he was not cold. To be continued. Puck and Blossom, from the German of Marie von Olfers, Part 2. Ow! sighed Blossom. That hurt! Never mind, said Puck, comfortingly. Things never go right the first time. It'll be better by and by. Then they went, and they went, till they came to a great big pond. This is a horrid world, sighed Blossom. Hope we dot to the end of it now. Hope we'll soon get back to our good old egg. But let's go see how it is over there first, said Puck. Ducky, ducky, come and carry us across. Ow, but then my little white frock will dit all dirty, said Blossom. What does that matter, answered Puck. 
We shall see how it is over there. Over there was very much the same as it was over here. The duck ducked them finely. So you'll know how it is down here, too, he said. Dripping, they stood upon the shore. Ow, ow, sighed Blossom, looking very miserable indeed. If it doesn't get better soon, I don't want to see anything more at all. I don't. Of course it'll get better, said Puck. The sun'll dry us. The sun looked out condescendingly from the clouds for a moment and then disappeared. Come, Blossom, said Puck. Who cares for the old sun? Just as though there wasn't any fire anywhere but up there. There's some down here, too. I know where it lives, down there in that little house. Yes, down there in that little house. In the ashes, inside the stove, said the cat, who was looking after things while the cook was away. It's asleep, said Puck. Wait, I'll soon wake it up. So he blew and he blew, but it would not wake up at all. The sparks looked out at him with grim and wrathful eyes, while Puck blew more and more madly on. At last, it did wake up. It sprang out of the stove, wild and raging. It grew bigger and bigger. The children fled, the fire behind them. Blossom ahead, terrified, shrieking, screaming. The fire had caught Puck had wrapped him around in a great sheet of flame. But Blossom cried and cried and cried so bitterly that the fire was all put out and there was nothing left but a great black smoke. Then Puck gathered all there was left of him and they went sorrowfully on their way to find their egg. Ah, me, it was broken in two and gone, but the nest was still hanging on the tree. In great haste, they climbed in, never venturing to leave it again. And if they are not dead, they are sitting there still. The End End of Section 9、10、of Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Twenty Five, April twentieth, eighteen eighty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume One, Issue Twenty Five, April twentieth. Our Post Office Box, South Windsor, Connecticut. We live near the Connecticut River, and when I am out of school, I hunt ducks and muskrats. I like to ride horseback when I can get a horse. Which is not often, but I can row on the river. I have two kittens to play with. One of them climbs up on father's back when he is eating, and when he takes a bite, Kitty will try to get half of it. We live near woods, and in the summer we ramble in them, and in the autumn we gather nuts. The land here is mostly cultivated for tobacco, and on the tobacco lots and on the river bank we find a number of Indian relics. One of the boys here found a store of arrowheads. There were about one hundred together. I am eleven years old. B. D. Archer. Fort Custer, Montana Territory. I am ten years old. My papa is captain in the army. I have never been to school and cannot write quite as nice a letter as some other little girls of my age. I have a big brother who is thirteen and a sister two years and four months. My brother's name is Willie. Last year he went off to school. Nanny, my sister, says very funny things. Sometimes she will come running in and say, "I am so hunky dory, I don't know what to do. Want something to eat?" Can any little girl tell what this means? I read a letter from an army girl who was older than I. I looked in the register to see if her papa's name was there, and I found it. My papa is in the Eleventh Infantry, and maybe Grace Henton and I will meet some day. I hope she will see my letter. Etta M. Galbraith. Manchester, New Hampshire. I like young people a great deal. Papa gets it and puts a pin in and cuts it, and we look at it till dinner is ready. When I go to bed, Mama reads it to me and lays it on the little table so I can look at the pictures before I get up in the morning. On George Washington's birthday night, I went to the barn to get Sally, my cat. I found her in an old barrel and was going to tip it over when I heard something squealing, a little squeal. There were two little kittens there. Mama named them George and Martha Washington. 
i shall be six in may i told all this to mamma and my name is john hartford ohio yesterday was easter and i and my little brother had twelve dozen eggs hid for dinner we decorated some with de calcomany pictures and they were very pretty i have thirteen little chickens and a pet hen which i call nelly gray my canary is named hetty some of the young correspondents write of spring flowers but i have not found any yet maud k bismarck dakota territory we have plenty of indians here although there are not so many as there were five years ago they come now mostly in scouting parties the party is often as large as custer's cavalry that was here in eighteen seventy seven are there many of the readers of young people who are fond of house plants i would like to hear what kinds they have and how they take care of them m r l we think judging from their letters that a large number of the readers of young people are fond of those beautiful household ornaments mary l s wrote a short time since from arkansas my house plants are my pets and i assure you i derive as much pleasure from them as if they were animated no doubt many others have the same feeling clara jackwith in answer to madison cooper's question in young people number twenty one says somar griffin of ohio is a very old man i do not know his exact age but he is about one hundred and fifteen years old he lost an arm about forty years ago by the falling of a tree brooklyn new york the other day a gentleman took dinner with my father and told us the following story a few years ago i spent several weeks with a friend who owned a sheep ranch near san antonio texas i had a very pleasant time hunting and fishing one day my friend saw a large wildcat trying to get into a sheep corral he seized his rifle and fired at the beast and it ran off pursued by the dogs that night when we were all asleep in the tent i was awakened by a warm breath on my face on opening my eyes i saw in the dim firelight the form of a large animal i was very much frightened but i had sufficient presence of mind to close my eyes and keep still suddenly the animal left me and turning my head slightly i saw that it had gone to the other side of the tent and was eating some of our stores very carefully i rose and crept outside the tent where was a pile of wood seizing a heavy stick i returned softly and creeping up behind the beast dealt it a tremendous blow on the head with my club which stunned it and i soon beat it to death my companions were awakened by the noise and when we replenished the fire and examined the beast we found it to be an immense wildcat it had a bullet wound in its shoulder and was no doubt the same one my friend had shot in the morning j burnett r montclair new jersey i am so interested in the pets which other people write about that i thought i would tell about peggy my gray kitten she plays marbles with me and when i spin my top she makes believe it is a mouse and you ought to see her go for it when the kitchen door is shut and she wants to come in she springs up to the latch holds on with three paws and presses the latch down with the other paw and so walks in i could tell ever so many funny things she does but i am afraid my letter would be too long harry a ten years fort assiniboine montana territory the indians i wrote you about have lived in their teepees all winter long during the very very cold weather too cold for me to go coasting it was often forty nine degrees below zero these indians have a large number of ugly dogs and sometimes they hitch them to their travois the names of the indians here are pagans gros ventre crow assiniboines bloods and crees the sioux and nez perce do not come very near to us as they are afraid our soldiers will fight them they send a knife and a pipe to make peace with the soldiers all the indians here are very poor and are killing their dogs and horses to eat as the buffalo have all gone away bertie brown westburn new york i am eleven years old i liked the music which was published in young people very much my papa who is teaching me music taught me to sing the sailor boy song in number nineteen we had snowfall day before yesterday to a depth of eight inches and now march twenty ninth the sleighs are passing on the road although the spring birds are hopping about on the trees in the orchard eudora s piney point maryland 
I live in the country and have two sisters and one brother. We are all very much interested in the story Across the Ocean or A Boy's First Voyage. The United States training ship Saratoga was lying in the Potomac River opposite our house last week. About 250 young men were on board and they were firing cannons almost all day. My cousin was on the ship a few years ago and he said the rules were very strict. The Saratoga is a very large boat and the sailors on board are both large and small boys. J. E. M. Frio Town, Texas. I am eight years old and I live in southwest Texas, which some people think a very wild country. I came from Georgia. I have never seen any Indians here, but I can look out the window and see wild rabbits running and I can hear mockingbirds sing. There is a very odd bird here called chaparral. I went fishing last week on the Frio River and I saw some turtles sunning themselves and ever so many buffalo fish swimming in the clear water. Mama reads young people to me every evening. Alfred H. C. Pine River, Wisconsin. We are so glad when Saturday comes, for then Papa brings young people. We each have a doll and a little wheelbarrow. We fill our wheelbarrows with sand and wheel them around. We bring in wood sometimes. We want Santa Claus to come. We have some new hats and are not going to wear hoods any more. We want to wear pants and not dresses, but Mama won't let us. Papa writes this because we can't write yet, but we have read our primer through. Charlie, six years, and Frankie, four years. East Watertown, New York. I like the story across the ocean very much. I have two cats and a dog named Tip and a canary named Ned. I am trying to study architecture and I have made a plan of a house and a church. I like architecture very much and mean to know all about it when I am a man. I was 10 years old the 2nd of April. I came pretty near being an April fool, didn't I? I have written this letter all by myself, where Grandma does not know I am writing. Frank T. W. Inglewood, Chiswick, London. It was my birthday yesterday, and my brother gave me young people for a present. My father and mother are in Italy, rejoicing in sunshine and flowers. I have no pets to tell you about. We live in a little village of red brick houses, and it is very pretty here. I thank you for making the paper larger than it was at first. It is lovely now. Mildred C., 12 years. Mary B. L., a little six-year-old girl of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, sends the following in big capitals. A fox went around where he knew there were some chickens. When he got there, he said, come down, and I will show you something more beautiful than you ever saw. You talk very nice, but I cannot trust you, said a hen, so we cannot come down. Daisy W. of Rochester, New York, reports having made a cake by Puss Hunter's recipe, and it was very nice. St. Louis, Missouri. We have two pet goldfish which are turning black. Can anyone tell me what is the trouble with them? Virgie C. Ogdensburg, New York. I am 10 years old and study geography, and I would like to know why Rhode Island is so called when it is not an island. I live on the St. Lawrence River. Last winter, more than 2,000 teams crossed on the ice, and this season, not even a man could cross on foot. Abner C.P. The first settlement of Rhode Island was made on the island where Newport is now situated, and which contains about 50 square miles. The Indian name of the island was Aquatnik. There are various stories in regard to the origin of the present name, but the one generally accepted is that it was bestowed on account of a supposed resemblance to the Isle of Rhodes. The state was afterward named from the island. H. W. Singer, your question is answered in post office box, young people number seven. Sally R. E., read the answer to F. S. in post office box, young people number 22. J. H. Knox, March is considered the proper season. Bessie C., the best way to prevent your bird from eating its eggs is to put its food in the cage at night, so that when the breakfast hour arrives there will be something fresh and tempting to distract its attention. If it still persists in this troublesome habit, we fear there is no remedy for it. C.S. Your inquiry about coloring Easter eggs came too late to be answered for this season, but you can practice now so that by next Easter you will be able to color eggs nicely. 
the best way is to purchase the coloring matter as it comes in little packages already prepared and with full directions for use the way you propose would also be very pretty winnie r keyed musical instruments similar in form to the piano were in use several hundred years ago the virginal shaped like an old-fashioned square piano was a favorite instrument at the time of queen elizabeth of england and by some authorities is supposed to have been named in honor of the virgin queen as she was called the harpsichord much in use during the last century was shaped almost exactly like a modern grand piano the honor of having invented the hammer which plays upon the strings of the piano now in use is claimed by several nations but the credit is probably due to italy although the first pianos are said to have been made in germany probably in the city of freiburg the piano was first called the hammer harpsichord afterward by the italian name fort piano as it could give both loud and soft tones while the harpsichord produced only loud ones the name was changed later to piano fort pianos are first mentioned as being in use about the middle of the eighteenth century idella g s edward l h and some other young readers in the far south inquire what are the willow pussies which northern children gathered with so much glee in the earliest days of spring they are the blossoms of the common low willow which grows in great abundance at the north and as they are the first signs that winter is passing away are always heartily welcomed the buds form in the autumn on the brown twigs and with the first warm spring sun long before anything green is started they swell and burst open the brown scaly covering disclosing a soft downy white ament or blossom resembling the toe of a white kitty this resemblance is perhaps the reason why children call these early flowers pussies a engel directions for feeding mockingbirds are given in post office box of young people number thirteen louis t your rabbit hut should be in a dry place and should have two apartments the sleeping room should be boarded in only you must have a door which you can open to clean it and supply it with fresh straw the other apartment should have graded sides and there is where the food should be placed you must feed your rabbits regularly two or three times a day they should have oats or bran for dry food and carrot tops cabbage leaves and fresh clover frequently if you have a yard let them run in the grass an hour or more every day during warm weather k posts request in young people number twenty two for long english words has been answered by bertha f h h p hattie n thomas j f albert h e kent k emily j m fanny s bertie c h h m edith c willie h h herbert n t g a page and others to print all the words sent would occupy too much space we give only a few of the longest super vacaniousness unconstitutionality interchangeableness incomprehensibleness anti-constitutionalist disproportionableness smiles and beleaguered have also been suggested as one has a mile the other a league between the beginning and the end favors are acknowledged from b e mace c hastings fred burgess william winslow a h patterson s brown jr lizzie c francis b olive russell i h m john moody mark marcy eddie s p henry s p henry k willie trot alvin g w anna wyram herbie e l lizzie m edwin wilson addie anderson lester o b julius weller royal effie barker fanny sumner altia austin annie carrier d j reinhardt metz hayes florence r h george wing Correct answers to puzzles are received from Philip Kruger, T. H., George Kite, Maud K., Laura B., W., F. Ozius, Sun Meme, Leon M. F., Fanny S., Sally Eli, George S. V., W. F. Bruins, E. B. Cooper, A. H. Ellard, North Star, John Collins, Lily McRae, Lily B., Annie C., Charles Slattery, Hattie Norris, 
M. K. S. S. G. Rosenbaum, H. L. B., H. K. Pryor, B. L. Townsend, Robert Davidson, M. O., Frank Payne, C. B. Howard, Alan Smith, George Schilling, Albert Hegeman. End of section 10. Section 11 of Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. Harper's Young People, Volume 1, Issue 25, April 20th, 1880. Puzzles from Young Contributors Number 1. Numerical Charade I am composed of eight letters. My 426 is a boy's name. My 1276 is a medal. My 8351 is to stain. My whole was an ancient king. A-H-E, 13 years. Number 2. Enigma My first is in hate, but not in love. My second is in robin, but not in dove. My third is in throw, but not in shove. My fourth is in stare, but not in look. My fifth is in line, but not in hook. My sixth is in straight, but not in crook. My seventh is in village, but not in town. My whole is a fairy of much renown. ESCM Number 3. Diamond Puzzle in blast, a girl's name, a reptile, to pinch, in blast, ALB. Number four, word square. First, a multitude. Second, a musical instrument. Third, to ascend. Fourth, a portion of time, birdie. Number five, numerical charade. My whole is a South American river of nine letters. My 537 is a period of time. My 6284 is a portion of the earth. My 91784 is to correct. KL. Number 6. Double acrostic. A marsh, a tumult, enormous, a state of the union, to spread over, a rope used for special purpose, surrounded by water, to ascent. Answer two trees rip van winkle answers to puzzles in number 22 number one 15 number two droop anna in streets yearly daisy pansy number three snow name omen went number four no lee me tangery number five a aunt anger T. R. Number 6. Whittier. Charade on page 296. Caterpillar. Advertisements. Harper's Young People. Harper's Young People will be issued every Tuesday and may be had at the following rates. Payable in advance, postage free. Single copies, 4 cents. One subscription, 1 year, $1.50. Five subscriptions, 1 year, $7.00. Subscriptions may begin with any number. When no time is specified, it will be understood that the subscriber desires to commence with the number issued after the receipt of order. Remittances should be made by post office money order or draft to avoid risk of loss. Advertising. The extent and character of the circulation of Harper's Young People will render it a first-class medium for advertising. A limited number of approved advertisements will be inserted on two inside pages at 75 cents per line. Address Harper and Brothers, Franklin Square, New York. Candy. Send one, two, three, or five dollars for a sample box by express of the best candies in America, put up elegantly and strictly pure. Refers to all Chicago. Address C.F. Gunther, Confectioner, 78 Madison Street, Chicago. Fine Trout Tackle. We offer a fine three-joint fly rod, 15-yard brass reel, 100 feet linen line, three flies, three hooks to gut, and leader complete by express for $5. 
by mail postpaid five dollars fifty cents sample flies by mail postpaid ten cents each per dozen one dollar complete catalog free peck and snyder manufacturers 124 and 126 nassau street new york fishing outfits catalog free r simpson 132 nassau street new york 100 scrap pictures 10 cents 100 transfer pictures 10 cents 12 floral embossed cards 10 cents 10 perforated mottos 10 cents 4 chromo mottos 10 cents 4 fine 6 by 8 chromos 10 cents 1 floral surprise 10 cents 2 oil pictures 9 by 12 10 cents 2 reproductions 9 by 12 10 cents 4 flower panels 10 cents 2 stereo views 10 cents 1 perfumed sachet 10 cents 1 lithograph 12 by 16 10 cents 25 birthday cards 10 cents all for one dollar postpaid stamps taken j w frizzell baltimore maryland old books for young readers arabian nights entertainments the thousand and one nights or the arabian nights entertainments translated and arranged for family reading with explanatory notes by e w lane 600 illustrations by harvey two volumes duodecimo cloth three dollars fifty cents robinson crusoe the life and surprising adventures of robinson crusoe of york mariner by daniel defoe with a biographical account of defoe illustrated by adams complete edition duodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents the swiss family robinson the swiss family robinson or adventures of a father and mother and four sons on a desert island illustrated two volumes octodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents the swiss family robinson continued being a sequel to the foregoing two volumes octodecimo cloth one dollar fifty cents sanford and merton the history of sanford and merton by thomas day octodecimo half bound seventy five cents published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price children's picture books square quarto about three hundred pages each beautifully printed on tinted paper embellished with many illustrations bound in cloth one dollar fifty cents per volume the children's picture book of sagacity of animals with sixty illustrations by harrison weir the children's bible picture book with eighty illustrations from designs by steinley overbeck weit schnorr etc the children's picture fable book containing one hundred and sixty fables with sixty illustrations by harrison weir the children's picture book of birds with sixty one illustrations by w harvey the children's picture book of quadrupeds and other mammalia with sixty one illustrations by w harvey published by harper and brothers new york sent by mail postage prepaid to any part of the united states on receipt of the price a wonderful clock the most astonishing thing ever heard of in the way of a timepiece is a clock described by a hindu rajah as belonging to a native prince of upper india and jealously guarded as the rarest treasure of his luxurious palace in front of the clock's disc was a gong swung upon poles and near it was a pile of artificial human limbs the pile was made up of the full number of parts of twelve perfect bodies but all lay heaped together in seeming confusion whenever the hands of the clock indicated the hour of one out from the pile crawled just the number of parts needed to form the frame of one man part joining itself to part with quick metallic click and when completed the figure sprang up seized a mallet and walking up to the gong struck one blow that sent the sound pealing through every room and corridor of that stately palace this done he returned to the pile and fell to pieces again when two o'clock came two men arose and did likewise and so through all the hours the number of figures being the same as the number of the hour till at noon and midnight the entire heap sprang up 
and marching to the gong struck one after another each his blow and then fell to pieces the penguin puzzle with two straight cuts of the scissors change this fish into an absurd penguin catching a herring charade an emperor kneels in sore dismay for his enemy cometh apace in this hour of need to whom shall he pray from which of his gods seek grace to his father's god the one the alone he cried and the answer burst on his wondering eyes a marvel shone pledge of hope and help from the god unknown and that answering sign was my first some voyagers weary of wooden walls are treading the land once more the father around him his children calls their god who had saved to adore seven angels all hasten god's answer to bring of his promise the seal and the sign arrayed is each one as the child of a king together they rival the flowers of spring and together my second they shine king henry hath crossed over into france with his lords and his nobles gay he would teach the frenchman quite a new dance and bid him the piper to pay such is design but the end who can tell who the fortunes of battle control one thing i aver and none will demur if king henry succeeds twill be by the deeds of his soldiers who carry my whole an ancient castle the Zarowitz recently visited with king oscar the second the famous old castle of gripshon in sweden the old keeper showed the Zarowitz a heap of straw and told him that his father the present czar had used it as his bed in the year eighteen thirty eight alexander in that year accompanied his father czar nicholas to sweden and it was during their visit to the castle that that severe parent insisted upon making his son sleep on straw it is popularly believed in russia that the stern nicholas never allowed his son and heir to sleep upon any more comfortable bed end of section eleven end of harper's young people volume one issue twenty five april twentieth eighteen eighty